Hello and welcome everyone to Life Science Across the Globe. My name is Janine Stevens and I am one of the Janelia organizers of this series. We are really excited for today's event on origins of humans and culture hosted by the National Center for Biological Sciences in India. We will have one hour of talks followed by a 15 minute moderated panel discussion and then 15 minutes for audience Q&A. And then immediately following the Q&A, we will have a special meet the panelists session. We invite students, postdocs, and all other trainees um, to join us to stay on the call and ask questions of our panelists and hear from them on various career related and mentoring related topics. And now I'll turn it over to Professor Uma Ramakrishnan to make some opening remarks on behalf of our host and CBS. Uma. Hi everyone and welcome to uh, this set of talks today. Uh, I'm Uma and I'm at the National Center for Biological Sciences, NCBS uh, in Bangalore. So the National Center for Biological Sciences uh, is a research institute under the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And uh, at the NCBS, we have scientists who work across uh, the scales of biology. And this uh, results in uh, really interesting science from uh, ecology and evolution uh, to cell biology, biophysics, biochemistry, um, and so on, as well as theoretical uh, approaches to understanding biological systems. So um, I think uh, it's really a pleasure for us and we're very excited to host today's session. I think all of us are really curious about our origins. Um, and in a sense, the study of human origins always includes study of human culture uh, and is a very interdisciplinary uh, field, bringing uh, to bear uh, you know, uh, genetics, uh, the new and uh, new kind of methods in genomics have really given a lot of uh, push to our understanding in this area. Uh, so it's really exciting today to have uh, a really uh, a great group of speakers. Uh, and to start off uh, and introduce them, we have uh, Professor Sarah Tishkoff from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she's a professor of biology and genetics there. And uh, as someone who, uh, when I was uh, doing my PhD, she was someone who inspired me because she actually combined field work uh, with genetics and genomics really early on to understand more about human origins. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Thank you, Uma, for um, inviting me to participate in this really exciting symposium with such an excellent and diverse set of speakers. So my role today is going to be to act as a moderator. I'm going to be introducing each of the speakers. They'll speak for roughly 18 minutes. And um, it would be great if everybody could post your questions in the Q&A box. And we're gonna hold the questions until after all the speakers have finished their presentations. We'll have then a general panel discussion and I will address any of the questions that you've put into that Q&A box. So please do do that. So I had the pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Himla Sujal, who is the Executive Officer of the Academy of Science of South Africa in South Africa. Himla, please take it from here. Hi, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good day, wherever you are. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, uh, for this uh, welcome and to the organizers for the invitation to participate. So let's start uh, by sharing my screen. As I say, whether we have to test it, uh, um, it works. And then when it is showtime, we have another experience. But here we go, all set. Well, yeah, uh, Sarah and I go back a long way. So I just want to share that uh, with the audience. Uh, when she was still a graduate student in Ken Kids Lab, uh, Sarah had engaged with us uh, in South Africa, so, so it's very good to have a rekindling of those fond memories. Uh, but today I want to feature a little bit more on uh, my journey and experience uh, doing uh, this sort of work for over three decades uh, until I changed my focus and now I'm the executive officer at the Academy of Science of South Africa. And I thought in this presentation, what I would like to do is kind of juxtapose how our understanding of genes, genealogy, and history uh, come together with a flavor of my experience from Africa. 
Well, no journey uh, about our past is uh, complete unless we understand the complexity of the narrative. No single discipline can converge on a reconstruction of the past. And so what I would like to do is um, to, to, to kind of put into perspective the interdisciplinarity of the various fields, starting with history, linguistics, archeology, span anthropology, paleontology, then the genetics from population and evolutionary genetics, and also the advent of how all of this has played out with respect to medical genetics. And a few years ago in uh, South Africa, I had the privilege of being part of a symposium where we brought together various uh, experts and scientists from the various disciplines to cross-pollinate our ideas. And I'm showing you the cover of the book I was privileged to edit, which was the first time in South Africa that we were actually talking to each other rather than speaking to members in our single discipline. And so, so this is part of that journey on how we uh, kind of cross-pollinate and talk to our colleagues in other disciplines so that the pieces of the puzzle we each contribute from our own areas of expertise can come together, come together to give us a bigger picture. Now, we are all familiar with this kind of cartoon representation of uh, genomic inheritance. So I am an individual. I didn't fall from the sky, but sometimes I think I do, but I am part of a family unit. And family units are parts of extended family units. And then we are part of a ethnic or a culture. Uh, we're part of a community, which may be very localized. Then in the broader context, we're part of our national, our regional, continental, and then part of the global sphere. So this kind of journey transcends from a living individual all the way into the past, which is somewhat different to the paleontological approach of where they look at specimens found from the past and try to reconstruct the present. And of course, we have different types of genetic markers. Uh, and talk about mitochondrial DNA passed through the exclusive matrilineal line. We talk about the Y chromosome that's passed from father to sons. And of course, every single uh, strand or, or segment of DNA we have in the nucleus is a combination of what we get from both our both parents. Now, while this cartoon stands at, uh, starts at the great grand parental level, showing us clear sticks of representing chromosomes, of course, we know that all of our chromosomes represents recombinations of many, many years uh, you know, into the past. So I also want to put out the concept that there are no pure populations, because part of the kind of racism issues that we've heard in the past uh, kind of work around the idea that we're part of like, you know, these uh, homogeneous pure populations. So, so let's forget that that exists, that we are all products of mixed uh, assemblages of, of genetic material that has passed down to us over the eons. And if I were to use this cartoon that Ken Kidd presented some years ago, um, and you know, I call it the Smarties diagram of the world, uh, when you look in the African continent, yeah, we have a full book, you know, uh, box of the different complements uh, of the Smarties in the box, but only a subset of that left Africa to eventually spread across the entire globe, uh, taking with it subsets of that genomic uh, information from Africa. Whereas in Africa, this continuum of the different uh, genetic uh, structures have been evolving over the eons. So Africa has also been in a state of constant evolution, uh, even though some individuals left Africa early on. Um, and then to kind of put what we have learned as a collective together, I mean, I only have 18 minutes to do the presentation. Uh, and if you were to look at some of the, the genetic uh, or the autosomal markers, I've done in collaboration with my former PhD student, Karina Schlebusch, who now works with Matthias Jacobson at Uppsala University. When we did this sort of analysis using SNP uh, DNA analysis, 
we found that on one branch of the human tree, uh, we placed all the Koi and San populations that we examined. And it took a considerable bit of time before we started to see substructure in other parts of Africa. And so from this, we can deduce that living Koi and San populations have retained some of the most ancient signatures or genetic signatures found in the world. Well, if you go back 100,000 years, they were not known as Koi and San. These sorts of demic units have come in more recently in our cultural uh, representativity of them, taking into consideration either their, their, um, their lifestyle by way of subsistence or language. And so these sorts of ethnic identities have been structured along the way based on certain uh, um, uh, commonalities that we see across human populations today. Well, from here, we've learned a lot in Africa. We've learned about the structure or, or the patterns of genetic variation uh, that are different in some essence from people living in the Western part of Africa, East Africa, Central Africa, and the Southern parts of Africa. We have learned about how um, certain genetic elements from Africa left Africa, but we've also had an input from other parts of the world into the African continent. So Africa has been the continent in, in a reasonable state of flux, having given off some of its genetic uh, uh, um, uh, structures, but also received input from outside. And uh, we have used uh, the patterns of uh, genetic variation within Africa, coupled with some of the historical, archeological and, and other narratives to talk about migrations in Africa that would have eventually contributed to the shaping of the regional patterns of variation we see across Africa. And in fact, some people have said that within Africa, there are like multiple types of activities going on, giving rise to, to the differences that we see. And yet, uh, we also have lots of similarities. Now, I just want to move on to what this all means when we talk about the value of genomics in society. In every single part of the African continent, you will hear different narratives about the value of how they see uh, what they understand about their origins and their narratives concerning their past uh, with their present day. And no better place to explore this than in Southern Africa. And, and this is the part that since leaving the bench that I, I feel very passionate about because now I'm seeing science in a much broader perspective uh, in terms of what is, what is the value of science to the average person on the street? How do we convey what we learn from you know, all the high powered uh, science and laboratory and, and then analytical work that we do? How does this make a difference to the person um, out there? And so, so that's a very exciting component of this new journey. I want to explore this by uh, looking at the place of the sun in the history of Africa and the world. Well, you know, does the sun have over the years been subjected to, uh, you know, really harsh uh, experiences? Uh, in the early days, because of the excellent tracking uh, experiences, they were taken as trackers uh, by um, Namibia, which was then Southwest Africa to use against uh, forces uh, from Angola and so forth. And um, when this uh, uh, army was dis disbanded, um, they were then moved to a place in north of Kimberley, about a hundred k's north of Kimberley at a place called uh, uh, Schmidtstrupt. And they were put in tented facilities. There were two groups of San that lived there. And, and I mean, their conditions were not the best. And uh, so, you know, this battalion was disbanded and uh, from Schmidtstrup, they were e eventually moved to a place called Plattfontein, closer to, to Kimberley. And this is where some of the people who had spent time uh, in that army now reside. And that community has grown and they've come into their own uh, living in, in a much more uh, structured environment, but not without much hardship. Um, and so given what we have learned about the sun, particularly the kind of antiquity 
that they have in their genomes. Uh, everyone who is doing genetics wants to study the sun. And, you know, they, we have heard about parachute scientists coming in, taking material and going away. And so this kind of war on the sun and eventually they produce uh, their own code of conduct uh, with respect to conducting research among them uh, towards the end of 2017. And all they ask for are simplistic uh, issues. Respect us, come through the front door and ask us for permission to do what you want rather than flying through the back door. Be honest with us, tell us what it is you want to do and not come with one proxy and then end up doing something else. Uh, they expect justice and fairness. They want to deal with us with respect and care. Uh, and so far, I must confess that in my dealings with the various communities, it's been, been good because I go out and I work with them and follow their rules and regulations to be able to conduct the work. So the process that they have put in place is really, really clear to us. And of course, uh, it's taken a lot of time to be able to, to, to take the science into the communities, uh, work for days on end before you even start to collect a sample to ensure that you have the opportunity to converse with people. And this brings me to the next section of my story, and that's the oral histories. So with a company locally called Jive Media, I produce some you know, cartoon type uh, tools to take around with me so that uh, people could understand from a very easy perspective some of the things that we were trying to do. And I'm just showing you a clip here. So of course, the first form of our history is through the oral traditions. All of us sit and listen to stories our parents, grandparents, and close relatives tell us about the past. And these are the fondest memories that we carry uh, with us as we go on. And then as we become more interested in the topic, we may create our own little family trees or genealogies and see how far back it can take us. Well, you know, we can't go back too many years with genealogy, but at least with the kinds of testing we do with ancestry testing and population genetic tools, we can learn a little bit more about ourselves. So having had the opportunity of intersecting with my science with the public at large, we, we were forced in my laboratory to conduct genetic ancestry tests because people were listening to some of the things uh, that we were talking about as we got papers published or you know, at meetings. And so, so I was involved in a documentary called So Where Do We Come From? featuring many uh, profiled South Africans and average people. And here I am giving the late president Nelson Mandela his uh, genetic ancestry test result. That alone was a goosebump uh, moment. But of course, it was only when I got back to my laboratory did I realize, oh, wow, I actually had a moment of having to explain to, to um, uh, President Nelson Mandela what his history was all about. And his mitochondrial line fell on the branch we commonly refer to as L0D. And so, as we know, there are many Koi and San people whose mitochondrial lineage falls on that uh, branch as well. And uh, because of that, it was amazing. Whereas in the past, you would struggle to engage with groups uh, to, to, to invite them to participate in your study. Suddenly, I had this overwhelming response by various communities across the country to come and speak to them about uh, the genetic tools. Uh, to, they wanted to be tested. And I mean, to this day, even though I'm not in that profile, I'm still getting requests from people to be tested. So, so there could be reasons why they want this. And some of them are like, you know, people want to use this knowledge of their history to engage with uh, their communities and the young people in particular, to bring them back to that value system that we have around family, et cetera. As you can imagine in South Africa, you know, the, the vast majority of people live in abject poverty with, with squalid um, conditions and, and may take to drugs and other sorts of things. And so, so people, uh, community leaders see these sorts of initiatives as mechanisms of bringing people together and fostering the values of family, of history, and you know, identity with respect to one's uh, past. 
But at that point, I want to say that genetic ancestry does not equal identity. I mean, each of us has an identity that could be very, very different to what we carry as part of our ancestry. And that's another important fact to get out uh, into the communities when we engage with them. So talking about society at large, I mean, as science, uh, we, we uh, just using the COVID pandemic as an example, where how much of information on science we have out there, how much of information we have about misinformation and fake news. I think we all have a responsibility as scientists to be creative in the ways in which we engage with the public at large. And talking about one's history and one's past is one way of growing that trust and encouraging people to value science. Remember, when you talk about evolution, you come up against another big uh, uh, barrier, and that is people's values based on creation, their faith, and their religion. Uh, and without being disrespectful, if you just give people opportunities to think about these as possibilities without like saying, oh, well, I don't trust what you believe in, et cetera. Instead of being confrontational, be creative and, and sell the power and the value of science. That's, that's been a very good challenge for myself. And, and it's been also a success story of being able to tell stories in a way that people can identify with. Last but not least, I just want to pick up on how we as scientists, uh, irrespective of what we work on, dealing with the public is one issue, but dealing with policymakers is another. And so I would like to end by saying that we need to bring together these values of how we take science in terms of spreading that value across to one and all in the general public and also to policymakers so that at the end of the day, what we value as scientists can be implemented. Thank you very much.